second meeting of the Welfare Reform Committee for 2015. Could everyone please make sure that the mobile phones and other electronic devices are switched to silent or airplane mode. Um, our first item of business is a decision on whether to take item three in private. Item three is a discussion on a proposal or for commissioned research. Are members happy to take that in private? Okay, that's agreed. Our second agenda item is consideration of the Welfare Fund Scotland Bill Stage 2. I uh, remind officials that they are not permitted to participate in this part of the proceedings. And I also remind everybody that they should have with them the copies of the Bill as introduced, the marshalled list of amendments and the groupings of the amendments. The groupings set out the amendments in the order in which they will be debated and the marshalled list sets out the amendments in the order in which they will be disposed of. I will briefly remind all those present of some of the main points of the procedure so that we are all as clear as possible. It will also help me quite a lot. Uh, there will be a debate on each group of amendments, and I will call members to speak in turn. Members who have not lodged amendments in the group but who wish to speak with, should indicate that by catching my eye or the clerk's attention. Following the debate on each group, I will check whether the member who moved the first amendment in the group wishes to press or withdraw it. If they wish to press it, I will put the question uh, on the amendment, and if a member wishes to withdraw their amendment after it has been moved, they must seek approval to do so. If any member who is present objects, the committee will immediately move to a vote on that amendment. If any member does not want to move their amendment when they are called to do so, they should say not moved. However, any other member may move such an amendment. If no one moves the amendment, I will immediately call the next amendment on the marshalled list. Voting in any division will be by a show of hands, and only committee members are allowed to vote. The committee is required to indicate formally that it has considered and agreed each section of the bill and I will therefore put a question on each section at the appropriate point. And that brings us to uh, section one. Um, the question is that section one be agreed. Are we all agreed? That's agreed. Uh, after section one, the general principles of respect and dignity of the applicant. I call amendment 24 in the name of Margaret McDougall, McDougall which is grouped with amendment 30. Margaret McDougall to move Amendment 24 and speak to both amendments in the group. Margaret. Thank you, Convener. Um, yes, I move both amendments in my name. General principles, um, as laid out in exercising its functions under Section 1 to 4 in respect of an applicant for assistance in pursuance of Section 2, a local authority must take reasonable steps to facilitate the following principles that the right to dignity of the applicant is to be respected and be that the particular needs and choices of the applicant are to be considered. This amendment ensures that while exercising its functions under sections 1 to 4 in respect of an applicant for assistance in pursuance of section 2, a local authority must take all reasonable steps to make sure that respect for and dignity of the applicant is taken into account and that the needs and choices of the applicant are considered. The principle is supported by organisations such as SCVO, the Scottish Campaign and Welfare Reform, the Scottish Churches, Parliamentary Office, Engendered Poverty Alliance and others who, like me, believe that dignity and respect should be the cornerstone of our approach to welfare. It is crucial that we embed the principles of dignity and compassion within the legislation at this stage. Furthermore, in Chapter 4 of the Scottish Government's document, Scotland's Future, there are numerous references to welfare and dignity, such as the benefit system should be fair, transparent and sympathetic to the challenges faced by people receiving them, respecting personal, personal dignity, equality and human rights. Section B relates to this point as it means the applicant has a degree of choice in the matter. As I have spoken to some people, and I'm sure many others around the table uh, will have had experiences of uh, constituents whereby in the old system, um, if they were provided with items like a cooker, which perhaps didn't actually fit into their kitchen, and uh, the bottle, so, or a washing machine that doesn't so, you know, they've got disabilities and they can't actually operate it. So if they had that degree of choice, uh, or were able to go and buy an item that suited their needs, it would allow them uh, that option. So the bottom line is we are dealing with 
vulnerable people and people that have fallen on hard times. To uphold dignity and respect, we also must uphold choice and the needs of the individual. One size does not fit all when it comes to welfare. Given the wide range of organisations that want dignity to be enshrined in the welfare system, and that the Scottish Government's own document highlights dignity and respect in the welfare system as a key tenant, then I think it is reasonable and responsible to include this in the bill and have it on the front of the bill, because I believe there already has been um, an example, for example, in the social care self-directed support. It already is. The general principles are on the front uh, page. So uh, that is... Set Amendment 24. On Amendment... We're speak to Amendment 24 of 30. Margaret, have you speaking to Amendment 30? 30... This is in the name of Kevin Stewart. Uh, no, I'll, you okay. know, I'll just leave we'll, that We'll just come now. to the other amendment um, mm -hmm. in, in another group. So, Kevin, to speak to Amendment 30. Uh, thank you uh, very much, uh, convener. Uh, and I, too, uh, share the belief uh, the applicants should be uh, treated with respect uh, and would like to ensure that their dignity is preserved um, at all times. We have seen um, with the uh, changes that have come from Westminster and the use of, of language that has come from that place that folks quite often not are, are not treated with the dignity uh, and respect uh, that they deserve. I do have some difficulty uh, with... Uh, Margaret McDougall's uh, amendment uh, round about um, choice. Now, you know, I think we would all uh, like to maximise folks' choices to the nth degree, um, but the reality is um, we have got a limited budget, some 30 odd million pounds, uh, to deal with welfare cuts of six billion. Um, and I, I think that, you know, the more uh, level of choice that we put in place means less people helped. And I think we've got to balance this out very, very carefully. I wish that this Parliament had all of the powers and all of the budget uh, to deal with welfare. Mm -hmm. And I think that we would deal with it much, much differently uh, than is being dealt with uh, by uh, Westminster at this moment in time. But I think we have got to recognise that we have limited abilities, uh, limited room for manoeuvre and limited budgets. And I think um, that in terms uh, of, of my amendment, uh, that is a recognition of that. And while, you know, I would always want to go that much further, we have got to be aware of where we are at. Thank you. OK, uh, I'll open it up to other members. I'll come back to you, to Margaret. But I'll open it up to other uh, members to... If they want to make a contribution, Annabelle. Could be I have a lot of sympathy with both the intention and the objective of both the amendments. Um, I have a technical concern, which is this, convener. What is the sanction um, if a claimant feels that a local authority has failed to discharge its duties uh, in accordance with the proposed amendment? And I ask the question because there are two reasons. I frankly am not sure how a court would interpret this. And secondly, I certainly don't want a local authority to be distracted from what we all want the local authority to be doing by facing defence of legal actions, which are, you know, claiming that this uh, amendment was, was breached. So I'm asking two questions. Um, are you satisfied about the ability of the court to interpret this? Um, and secondly, what is the sanction? Margaret, you get an opportunity to wind up at the end of the discussion, so I'll, I'll come back to you uh, after we've, we've had a debate. Ken? Uh, thanks very much. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, they've turned the microphones off since they left the committee. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much, uh, 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 convener. And can I um, uh, congratulate both members on the, uh, moving these amendments and speak in support of uh, Margaret McDougall's in particular? And I think it's particularly good that we're starting discussion this morning um, with a, an overview of what the bill is trying to achieve and the principles underpinning it. In some ways, the bill is a very uh, simple and pragmatic uh, replacement measure for the social fund that preceded it. But the bill also offers us, the Scottish Parliament, an opportunity 
uh, to lay down the direction of travel, to put dignity and respect at the heart of our thinking for welfare, as more and more powers come to the Scottish Parliament giving us responsibility for welfare, I think it's quite important that we establish um, not just what we want to see from welfare, but what we, what the kind of society we want to, to build here in Scotland. And so I think it's quite important that we put the principles in the Bill itself. Now, um, as you see, I, I, I'm, I'm both uh, proposals before me uh, uh, would attract my support. Um, the uh, proposal from Kevin Stewart captures the words uh, respect and dignity, uh, and, and I would be interested to hear what the Minister makes of that particular amendment. Uh, I was slightly concerned that Mr Stewart didn't support Margaret McDougall's amendment, and particularly that he, he uh, seemed to hesitate over the word choice. Now, I think this, again, if we are to give and treat people with dignity and respect, it is about allowing them to exercise choice. It's not, it's not choice to uh, make demands on the social fund, because that's simply choice within the decisions already made by the local authority. If you look at the way it's worded, it's choice after uh, in exercising its functions under section 1 to 4 in respect of an applicant. In other words, this is not the choice of an applicant to demand, make demands. It's uh, the, uh, a requirement for us and the state to make sure that in uh, assessing the needs of an applicant, we offer them their views and allow them to make a choice from the from what uh, the choice is open to us uh, as a society. And, I, and I, I have to say that it's, I think it's quite an important word. Not only is it an important word, it is the word that was used by the government, the Scottish government, in a previous measure. The reason that I believe that uh, Margaret has placed this amendment is that it copies the uh, wording and principles that the Scottish government put in place when passing the Self-Directed Support Act. So, uh, I, and we thought that if it's good enough for the Self-Directed Support Act, then surely it's good enough for this Act too. And in reply to the point made by Annabel Goldie, clearly, like any Act, uh, it would be open for judicial review. If an applicant was um, uh, felt that their dignity and respect uh, was not upheld by the way they were treated, they would be open to take it to judicial review. Now, that's a difficult course of action for anybody, but that's, that would be the course. And I, and I have... Confidence, and I'm sure Annabel does too, in the ability of the courts to interpret our legislation. But I certainly don't think that judicial review as a sanction is likely to be uh, one that's abused by applicants. I think it's more important that we state this as a principle and that therefore local authorities and those who are carrying out this Act uh, are aware of that uh, principle on the face of the bill and aware that that sanction is uh, at the back of their minds. And I think it will make them more focused in making sure that we do uh, put these principles into practice. So, uh, for those reasons, and the fact that it's been supported by the wider voluntary sector, the SCBO and many others that Margaret quoted, I think it's very important that we take this step, uh, and I particularly recommend that we support Margaret McDougall's motion, uh, amendment uh, number 24. I don't see how in the, in the case. I'll go to the Minister to speak through the debate. Thank you, Convener. In respect of amendments 24 and 30, it's always been a priority that welfare funds should be de delivered in such a way that the dignity of welfare fund users is preserved. And I agree with the committee's suggestion that we have an opportunity to take a different approach to welfare in Scotland, regardless of the funds available, our services will be delivered with respect and understanding. And this is an issue that I've been considering for some time now, and we've been working with local authority practitioners through the series of decision-making workshops that we've been running to raise awareness of the challenges that some of the applicants to the fund face and to try and ensure that decision-makers put the applicant and the needs at the centre of their work. And I've seen in my visits to local authorities the efforts that local authority staff make to ensure that applicants are assisted in a timely and appropriate way. That said, I can appreciate how important it is to send a clear signal about the need to treat applicants with dignity and respect. And I've thought carefully about this matter for some time, and I do believe it's right to give priority to this aspect of the fund by including appropriate reference to it in the bill. But there are, of course, two very similar amendments to consider today. Amendment 24, which has been proposed by Margaret MacDougall, is laudable in its intention, but my concern with this amendment centres around the potential impact it could have on local authority resources. 
It's the reality of the situation that, as Kevin Stewart said, there is a limited budget for welfare funds, which is coming under pressure. And we have to acknowledge the demands that exist on the fund and the opportunities for savings that exist through local authorities bulk buying goods that they can distribute through the fund. This is alongside the added administrative burdens that local authorities would have to bear if we accepted Margaret MacDougall's amendment. The guidance on the current interim scheme makes clear that where an individual has particular needs, they should be met, and I am determined <coughs> that this continues under the permanent arrangements. We will look again at the guidance for the permanent, ar permanent arrangements to see if there is more we can do to ensure that where applicants have a real genuine need for a non-standard product, there is a clear understanding of how this should happen. I am therefore going to support Amendment 30, which I believe captures the essence of what stakeholders have been calling for without bringing additional pressure to bear in local authority budgets. So I urge, urge Margaret MacDougall to withdraw Amendment 24 and ask the committee to accept Amendment 30. OK, I'll come back to Margaret MacDougall to wind up the debate and to press or withdraw. <coughs> Margaret, you have an opportunity to been raised. Yes, thank you. Um, I mean, I think Ken answered the question on... An that Annabelle raised around sanctions and, you know, that the judicial review is there and also from the, the user's point of view, I mean, they can appeal as well. So um, I don't have concerns around that. I mean, Kevin Stewart and the Minister uh, raised that the, you know, there are limited funds available to local authorities, which we know, uh, but I'm not asking for their, uh, people to be able to demand an excessive amount. Or, you know, more, or, you know, they go out and buy uh, the very best and, uh, items. What I'm saying is that it shouldn't cost any more just to be able to have choice, you know, you, because uh, it's just to give people that little bit more respect and that they can actually say, well, this is what I need. I've identified this as being, it would suit my for example, my kitchen, or it suits my needs. Uh, this is how much it costs. And would the authority fund that? I mean, and if it's above a certain level, I think the local authority would be perfectly within their rights to say, well, no, uh, that's out with uh, our funding allocation. You can't have that. So um, I think that uh, that's choice should be there. And choice doesn't mean it's going to cost more. It actually might cost less at times. Exactly. Um, so um, I press with my amendment. So that brings us to the question then uh, that Amendment 24 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Okay, I'll put it to a vote. All those uh, in favour of Amendment 24 in the name of Margaret McDougall, please indicate. So, no. <laughs> <laughs> He's, 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 you get the opportunity to speak, but you don't get the opportunity to vote. <laughs> okay, so we'll do that again. So. And those against? Okay, that amendment falls. So, um, five votes to two. I then move on now to call Amendment 25 in the name of Ken McIntosh, which is grouped with Amendments 26 and 28. Ken McIntosh to move Amendment 25 and speak to all our other amendments in the group. Okay, Ken. Uh, thank you, Dana. And uh, as we know, the current bill places no restrictions on the circumstances in which a local authority can decide to make an award uh, to an applicant in kind, that is, in goods or vouchers ra rather than in cash. The effect of this amendment would not be to prevent councils from doing so, but would simply enable the Scottish Government to produce regulations detailing the circumstances in which a local authority could make a non-financial award. This power could be used to ensure, for example, that local authorities take applicants' circumstances and preferences into account when deciding on the nature of the, the award. It could be used, and this follows on from our previous conversation, it could be used to ensure more say or more choice for the applicant in the process. 
And following on, it's clear from the discussion in the last group of amendments that all colleagues in the committee and the Minister too uh, share my belief that the principles of dignity and respect should underpin our approach to welfare in Scotland. But on the other hand, it's unfortunately clear from the witnesses who gave evidence to our committee that a more common experience for those relying on state support here in Scotland at times of difficulty is one of feeling judged, stigmatised and of being made to feel small. Every bit is important, if not more so, than the principles that we state are the way we put them into practice. We heard direct evidence that those using vouchers or tokens in local shops can be uh, it can be stigmatising, embarrassing, undermining applicants' sense of dignity. Yes, in some <coughs> circumstances, non-financial awards may be the most practical and the most cost-effective way of meeting applicants' needs. But we also heard that such awards can be problematic and difficult. For example, we heard that issuing vouchers instead of cash can undermine a family's ability to achieve best value by budgeting, spreading payments or shopping around for goods. Items awarded do not always meet the identified needs of the applicant and their households. Is it not the case, for example, that disabled applicants and those with very specific needs may be better placed than the local authority to identify and purchase an item that meets their needs? For families in rural areas, the ability to find a shop to take vouchers is likely to be more limited as well as stigmatising. Surely our intention with our approach to welfare in this bill, in particular, is to build up resilience by at the very least leaving as much choice as possible in the hands of the recipient. I would say to the Minister, you and I don't get paid in furniture or tokens, and in fact if we were to do so, I think we might be offended or feel patronised. So why should we be surprised that applicants for welfare might feel similarly? Are we trying to make people feel worse or give them the hand up at their time of need? And I thought the SCVO briefing put it very well when it said, for many, Having cash to buy what they need is by far the best option, not least because it gives people some semblance of control and dignity at a time when they cannot control the factors which have led them into hardship in the first place. So whatever our good intentions, what is also clear from the voluntary sector organisations who give evidence is their concern that in-kind awards from the fund seem to have become the default position. Only half of all crisis grants and less than 20% of community grant awards made by way of, are made by way of cash, cheque or direct bank transfer. Now it may be that community grant awards where people are looking to furnish a flat for example and a whole pack of goods, it might be the best option but this amendment does not rule that out. Just to be clear, it would not disbar local authorities from, from providing support in kind rather than cash. What it does do is allow the Scottish Government to specify the conditions which would need to be satisfied before a non-financial award could be made. Such an approach would not prevent local authorities from making awards in kind. It would ensure that proper consideration was given to the needs of the applicants in each case and that decision-making was more transparent. It would also provide recipients with a clear basis on which to challenge unsuitable awards and any lack of consideration on the part of local authorities. And I'd like to move Amendment uh, 25 in my name, not 26 and 28 at this stage, just move Amendment 25. People do, Ken, thanks. Thank you. Um, I'll open the discussion up to the committee and go to Kevin to be followed by Annabelle. Uh, thank you. Uh, convener, we uh, heard uh, a lot during the course of evidence taking uh, and had uh, a number of written observations on these particular issues. And I think one of the key things uh, that we need to put on record here is that many of the folks who gave evidence actually uh, were very thankful. Um, for the in-kind uh, uh, contributions that they received. And I think the best examples are probably some uh, from some of the young folk who left the care sector, who uh, felt that the furniture packages that they received from the local authorities uh, that they were staying in uh, was the best way uh, of, of dealing uh, with the situation. I come back to the point that I made previously, convener, in the fact that we have got a very limited amount of money to deal with cuts which amount to some £6 billion. Um, and my great fear is that if we uh, restrict uh, local authorities from being able uh, to strike deals uh, to get 
to, to bulk buy goods, uh, then we will be helping less and less people. Uh, and I think the key thing in all of this is helping as many people in need as we possibly can. I do have some sympathy uh, for the intent of the amendments, but I don't think that the bill is the correct place to address the issues. And I think in some regards we have got to allow for the independence of local authorities uh, and for them to apply common sense and logic uh, to their day-to-day -day business uh, in helping folks in need. Thank you. Annabelle to be followed by Joan. Again, I have no doubt whatsoever about the good intentions behind the, the amendment. <clears throat> but going back to my observations in regard to Margaret McDougall's amendment, I do want local authorities convener to have the widest possible latitude and discretion as to how they meet need. And I am worried that this would restrict that, that latitude and that breadth of, um, of um, decision making. And I, I just say my earlier concern that I alluded to about Margaret McDougall's uh, amendment, um, if you look at what her amendment would have achieved. She wanted the particular needs and choices of the applicant to be considered. But perversely, if that had been accepted, uh, this amendment would then restrict the ability of the local authority to respond to that. So I, I am troubled that Mr McIntosh's amendment would be inflexible and restrictive on a local authority, and, and I'm unable to support that. I um, do, like the other speakers, uh, acknowledge the good intentions of the amendment. I think it is important to remember that the people who we're talking about here are really people who are facing absolute destitution. And if the pot that we have to help them is limited, I think it's 38 million against 6 billion of cuts, then um, if we don't use that cost effectively, mm -hmm. then other people facing absolute destitution um, will be deprived of, of, of help in the end. Um, so, although in, you know, in an ideal world, um, perhaps we would like things to be different, I think we have to be pragmatic. And, uh, and also bow to um, my, my colleague Kevin Stewart, who was here and, and heard the evidence from people who actually found that um, very often um, payment in kind suited, uh, suited them. So, I, for that reason, I, I couldn't support the amendment either. Margaret. On, in support of Ken McIntosh's amendment, um, I mean, I've, I've heard the others' arguments uh, against that, but I mean, choice doesn't have to mean more costly. It can. I mean, some of these bulk purchases actually they're set, and that's it. Whereas um, we all know their sales go on, and there are opportunities to actually reduce the cost uh, and also uh, Ken made the point about uh, vouchers particularly in rural areas how much would it cost a particular individual to travel to a city for example so that they could then um, use the vouchers because they won't be able to use them in local sh shops and the local authority must have that discretion to and we're saying they should have that discretion and but give consideration to each individual on a case-by-case -case basis. And I know there will be times when individuals may well have had um, assistance in the past and not spent that money as they should have done. Therefore, that would be a case for uh, a local authority to preside, provide uh, with, you know, in-kind or, or vouchers. But it, just to give an individual who's in that situation that little bit more control over their life so that they can then decide what they want and what is best for them. Uh, therefore, I support Ken's uh, amendment. Deputy Convener, wanted to contribute? Yeah, thank you, um, Convener. Um, it was just to say that <coughs> having listened to some of the arguments um, in the area of, of choice not costing more, I think that would fly in the face of the evidence that's been provided for COSLA as to some of the difficulties that might be involved, particularly um, in terms of what um, payment method would be available to some people in terms of what kind of bank cards or post office accounts they have in those areas. So I do think it is a concern. I also feel that the bill is intended to put the individual at the heart of, of the decision-making process. 
And the examples we've been given of vouchers in rural areas or washing machines or co cookers rather that don't fit and are not suitable, I would say is a failure in that process, but not something that should be on the face of the bill. I think I agree with my colleagues that this should be at the discretion of the local authorities who know how best to fit in, in their own individual areas in providing this fund. I'll go to the Minister now for her contribution on this amendment. Um, convener, there are a number of considerations to take into account when we're considering amendments 25, uh, 26 and 28, which taken together would result in limits being placed on the circumstances in which local authorities could make non-financial assistance available to applicants. And I was very interested in the evidence that the committee heard from users of the Interim Scottish Welfare Fund, which came out in support of local authorities providing goods to fulfil community care grants. And we also commissioned Heriot Watt University to undertake an independent evaluation of the Scottish Welfare Fund as part of our ongoing work to improve the interim scheme and the development of the permanent arrangements. And the Heriot Watt evaluation also suggests there's a support for awards and kinds as long as they're appropriate for the needs of the applicant. And equally, we heard for someone with young children or limited mobility, having an item delivered and installed because there's also services provided by the local authority can be preferable to, to receiving cash, but it must meet their needs. And I recognise that third sector organisations have concerns about the provisions of goods. However, we have to acknowledge the pressures that exist on the fund and the opportunities for savings that exist through local authorities bulk buying goods that they can distribute through the fund. And I'm also aware that bulk purchase goods will not meet the needs of all applicants, and that's why the guidance for the interim scheme is clear that awards should meet the needs of the individual, and this is something that I'm absolutely positive will continue. We will look again at the guidance for the permanent arrangements to see if there's more that we can do to ensure that where applicants have a genuine need for a non-standard product, that there's a clear understanding of how that this should happen. So I'm not minded to change our approach in respect of community care grants, but I have been giving some thought how, to, how awards are made for crisis grants. But it's an issue that I don't think needs to be addressed in the bill. However, when we consult on the regulations and the statutory guidance that will support the Act, we will explore how to ensure the principles of this amendment are taken on board in respect of crisis grant payments. And whilst understanding and having sympathy with the intent of the amendments, I don't think the bill's the correct place to address these issues. Therefore, I don't support the amendments and I urge the committee not to agree to amendments 20, 25, 26 and 28. <coughs> I'll come back to Ken McIntosh to wind up the debate and to press or withdraw the amendments. Uh, thank you, uh, Convener. And I can I say I was both uh, slightly encouraged and a bit discouraged too by the, the contributions uh, in the debate. Um, first of all, uh, I'm sl slightly concerned that uh, either I didn't explain the meaning of this or people have misinterpreted. This does not, this amendment or these amendments would not restrict the ability of a local authority to provide goods in kind. They would not do so. All we would do would be put the onus on at least considering giving an in-cash award first and it would allow the government to stipulate the conditions under which in-kind awards could be made. It, it does not restrict freedom whatsoever. In fact, I didn't follow Annabel's logic. She suggested that it would uh, it, it restricted the choice in the previous amendment. It does not. It echoes or repeats exactly the principles that we were trying to get in place in the previous about choice, dignity and respect. And it does not contradict them. It absolutely tries to put them... I'm sorry... Intervention as a debate. Yeah, well, so, if, if you want to take an intervention, yeah, well, why not? <laughs> I was merely pointing out to Mr. McIntosh that if that original amendment from Mrs. McDougall had been accepted, it actually creates a paradox because, on the one hand, it's saying to a local authority the particular needs and choices of the applicant are to be considered. Mm -hmm. Well, that might be that the applicant could need goods or you know particular support or services, and yet. Um, what Mr McIntosh's amendment is doing is actually trying to restrict the local authority's ability to look at the overall holistic needs of the claimant. So that was the, the, the paradox I identified. Uh, it's quite clear that Annabel Goldie has totally misunderstood the effect and the intention behind this amendment. If that's what she thinks, it does, because it does none of those things. It absolutely gives 
the local authority the ability to take all the needs of the applicant to, into account, rather than patronising the applicant by deciding that the local authority knows best. And, it repeat, and I would repeat again, this is exactly how to put dignity and respect into practice in our bill. If we actually mean what we say when we're talking about respecting <coughs> people in our welfare system, then you have to treat them as you would treat anybody else in society and give them an element of choice. In, it, it, throughout, I mean, all the voluntary... Can I just tell you who supports this? Child Poverty Action Group, the Poverty Alliance Scotland, SEVO, Inclusion Scotland, One Parent Family Scotland, Bernardo Scotland. We've heard evidence before from many people, Oxfam I thought were very good, in giving support to any society, you are better giving people cash because it builds resilience, dignity and respect. And it is as true in Scotland as it is true in any other country. In this case, we are not insisting, this does not insist well, that people give cash. What it does is... It, it's it, an intervention. It, Yes, I'm happy to. Um, uh, I thank you for taking the intervention. Um, I think you've also got to recognise that there were a number of witnesses, including folks who have accessed the Scottish Welfare Fund, who felt that the package of goods that they were offered was absolutely uh, the right thing. Uh, and, you know, I think we have got to take cognizance of the fact that in many, many places, the vast bulk of places, um, this is working well and the fact is that local authorities are being helpful in terms of what is offered now i think the difficulty in putting common sense uh, into legislation is that you can't and i think i think that i think that you know what you are looking for is common sense which i hope would apply across the board and as uh, claire adamson has said COSLA seem to be well aware of the logic that needs to be applied in these cases, and that's why they have got the best practice group. If I may say so, uh, Mrs Stewart, I'm looking for far more than common sense. I'm looking to put dignity, choice and respect into a bill in terms of principles and in terms of practice. And if I may give an example, I was in Aberdeen yesterday and uh, I visited Instant Neighbour, who I'm sure Mr Stewart know well. Instant Neighbour are a, a fantastic example of an organisation that's been around for 30 years supplying people with exactly these goods. Furniture packs, furnishings, uh, floor coverings, uh, assistance when people move into houses. The local authority no longer allow applicants to use Instant Neighbour. They insist on bulk purchasing brand new items from a place in Broxburn. Now, there's nothing wrong, I'm sure there's nothing wrong, but these are, these are cheaply made, they're mass produced and they don't last. And the effect of that means that Instant Neighbour now end up putting all these reconditioned goods into landfill, so environmentally unsustainable, removes all the choice from the applicants, and an organisation that's been going for 30 years, that's a social enterprise, that's employing great people in Aberdeen, no longer gets this service, no longer gets that money going to the local economy. And I have to say, these are the sort of choices. But either way, and that's an example of you know, something where I'd question the decision, but either way... Both choices, under the amendments that I'm moving, would be open to the local authority. This does not rule out. I've actually specifically stated that in many circumstances, what, for example, a young man moving into a flat for the first time wants, he doesn't want money. What he wants is somebody to say, here's a pack of goods, here is the furnishings, the plates, the crockery, the cooker that you need. That's what they want. And they'll be able to choose that. They would actually have the choice. So in that situation, they would be asked and their views would be taken into account. In the end, the decision is still one for the local authority but at least their choice would be considered. And that's what I'm trying to suggest in this case. Now, I thought that um, I thought a number of other points were made. The Minister and Mr Stewart as well um, uh, both talked about cost-effectiveness and talked about uh, as, as if this would somehow place extra demands on the system. This does not uh, in any way uh, increase the demands or increase the demands of the Scottish budget at all, in any way. This is already operating entirely within the cash limits of the system. And I'll end on this point, uh, uh, convenient if I may. At the moment, in health and social care, we are moving to self-directed support, specifically because we recognise that the personalisation agenda is very good for your health and your well-being. We recognise that if you give people more control over the carers they employ, it's actually good. Now, in this case, why can we not apply exactly the same principle in terms of welfare? We're not giving them any extra money. We're not giving them... All we're doing is asking for their say, for a bit of choice. And if it's good for people's health, uh, surely it's good for their well-being too. Uh, can I say, and to end on a very positive note, the Minister did say that she recognised the spirit in which this has moved. She did suggest, and I actually agree with her, that it's far more important for crisis grants than it is for community care grants. 
and I was very encouraged by her, 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 her remarks that she would consider putting this in regulations, and I, I look forward to perhaps hearing more on this on, on stage three. But I hope, having said that, she will not mind if I actually put this to the vote at stage two. And I move. So the um, amendment has been uh, moved and pressed. So I ask the question, uh, Amendment 25 be agreed? Are we all agreed? Okay, so I'll have to put that to vote. All those in favour of Amendment 25? Uh, <laughs> those against? Okay, that's uh, two votes in favour of the amendment and five against, so the amendment falls. Uh, I call Amendment 26 in the name of Ken McIntosh, which has already been debated with Amendment 25. Ken McIntosh to move or not move? Not moved. Does not move, no Okay. Um, okay, and that takes us then to Amendment 27 in the name of Ken McIntosh. Uh, it's in a group on its own. Ken McIntosh to move and speak to Amendment 27. Uh, thank you, Governor. Third time lucky. Uh, the effect of this amendment would be to include families facing exceptional pressure amongst the list of groups classed as qualifying persons for the purpose of community care grants. Uh, the Interim Scottish Welfare Fund, introduced by the Minister, and which this bill puts on a statutory footing, lists five categories of applicants who can be awarded a community care grant. Four of those categories are explicitly included on the face of the Welfare Fund Scotland bill before us this morning. The only group of applicants <coughs> which is left out, and which is not mentioned anywhere in the bill, is that of families facing exceptional pressure. Now, that would mean, for example that individuals who are part of a family facing homelessness would qualify for an award, but someone looking after a disabled child would not. An individual at risk of ending up in prison would be given support, but someone fleeing domestic violence would not. Now, given that those very circumstances I've described would have offered families eligibility under the original UK Social Fund, as well as currently under the interim scheme, which ministers drew up to replace it, I am not sure that is what the Minister intends. As members will be aware from evidence to the committee, there are many, particularly in the voluntary sector, who believe this omission from the face of the bill could affect the health and well-being of some already vulnerable families. The Scottish Council for the Voluntary Sector, uh, the Child Poverty Action Group and One Parent Family Scotland are just some of the organisations who have highlighted their ongoing concerns that the proportion of grants made to families with children is already relatively low. For example, the annual Scottish Welfare Fund figures for last year show that only 20% of those applying for a community care grant are categorised as being a family under exceptional pressure. The statistics are not directly comparable, but figures for the UK Social Fund show that this compares with more than 53.5% of the community care grant budget which was spent on families facing exceptional pressure in the previous year, from 20% to 53.5%. In fact, the figures strongly suggest that families are underrepresented amongst all the five current categories of community care grant claimant. Measured by those who are in receipt of child benefit, for example, possibly only around a fifth of all claimants are families with children. Carers Scotland are another group who are worried that the bill before us could make that situation worse inadvertently or otherwise. And they gave us some direct examples. They quoted one carer who said, my husband's movement and coordination leads to a high number of breakages, crockery, furnitures, furniture and fittings. I constantly need to fix or replace items. Another described how the washing machine is on every day. It isn't designed for that sort of use. And this means it breaks. When it breaks, I have piles of soiled laundry building up. These are the occasions when community care grants are needed. And these are the very families who have little or no savings to respond to unexpected expenses and for whom this bill is a lifeline. I would urge members to support this amendment. Okay, I'll open up to members. Claire. Right. Thank you, convener. Um, well, I, again, <coughs> I absolutely um, commend Ken McIntosh for, for the reasons behind bringing this amendment forward and we would recognise those situations. However, on examining um, the proposal, um, I do not feel that it's within the legislative competence of this parliament to introduce another category and in the, in the hope that we would present a bill that will be competent and go through the procedure unfortunately in this situation i wouldn't be able to support this amendment 
I'm going to give Mr McIntosh perhaps some unexpected encouragement. <laughs> I wanted to listen to the debate, and I think you have identified um, a category which could indeed be a situation of great distress to an individual or a family and is not adequately covered by the provisions as they currently define what is an exceptional event or an exceptional circumstance. So whether or not this is ultra vires of the Act, I have no idea. But you know what, Mr McIntosh, I think we should give it a shot, and I'm going to support you. Thank you, convener. Uh, it's uh, uh, very interesting uh, in terms of the debate thus far. Um, but what I would be grateful for um, is uh, for the minister during her comments uh, to talk to us uh, about the legislative competence uh, and whether uh, that this amendment would take section two beyond that competence. Uh, my understanding. Uh, that there is a uh, complication in terms of the wording of the Section 30 order, which grants the Parliament the power to legislate in this area. And the last thing that I would want to see um, is us passing this amendment today and then for the entire bill to fall. Uh, I wish that we didn't have to rely uh, on Section 30 orders and that we had complete competence over welfare, but at this moment that is not the case. So I would be grateful for the Minister's comments in that regard. Convener, thank okay. you. Okay. Uh, Margaret, to be followed by Joan. I just wish to speak in support of Ken McIntosh's amendment because I think it, it would add to the bill and you know, if there is a constitutional reason why it shouldn't be included, I mean, I just, I don't get that at all. I mean, I just, if you're a member of a family that's not co presently covered by what we're intending in this bill, this then adds it in. Um, because certainly um, Child Poverty Action Group in particular are very keen that this should be added in and you know, I'm sure you've all had the same uh, correspondence as myself. They're talking about the kind of families that are affected by this and ch change include, for example, <coughs> excuse me, lone parents with young children who need household items following violent breakdown of a relationship, families in which sudden deterioration in the con condition of a disabled child justifies an award for a washing machine or families experiencing hardship as a result of a localised disaster and urgently need the replacement of essential household items. Um, none of that is uh, covered presently, and if we included this further um, category, that would include all those. And I support that amendment. Okay. Joan? Yeah, I'm very concerned about this because um, I would want to support the amendment. Um, um, it you know, stands to reason why um, one would want to support um, families in, in these circumstances. Um, if it is the case that um, it's beyond the legislative competence of the Parliament, well, my natural instinct is to say, so what? But, I mean, that's not going to get us anywhere. Because if, if the bill falls, I mean, that's the, that's the, uh, the real risk. So I'm really torn on this because I would like to support the amendment, but at the same time, I don't want to do anything that would result in the, the bill falling. And, uh, and like Mr Stewart, um, I would welcome the comments on, from the Minister to, to explain why it's uh, against the legislative competence of the bill and also like what, what, we can, what we're going to be doing to help these families um, who are clearly you know, in, in exceptional need. Going to the Minister, I ask a specific question which I hope she'll be able to answer uh, around this uh, competency issue. Uh, I would be grateful if you could clarify if this amendment was to be added and it was deemed to be out with the, the competency of the bill, who would challenge that? Because it would only be a challenge externally which would actually uh, bring this uh, bill into disrepute. Minister, for you to answer the, the debate. Right. Okay, I'll, and I'll respond at the end to, to your point, uh, convener. I mean, I can absolutely understand and see why stakeholders are pressing for families under exceptional pressure to be included in the bill. It is currently a descriptor in the interim scheme guidance. However, the Scottish Government doesn't have a free hand in able to provide this explicitly in the face of the bill for, every, you know, for everyone who might benefit from welfare funds. 
If we were to accept Amendment 27, it's our view it would take the provisions of the Bill beyond the competence of the Scottish Parliament. Section 2 of the Bill replicates the amendment of Schedule 5 to the Scotland Act 1998, made by the Scotland Act 1998 modica modification of Schedule 5, Number 2, Order 213, which gives the powers to the Parliament to legislate in this area, and that's commonly known as the Section 30 Order. And you, you asked about competence. Anyone um, could challenge it. Section 2 of the Bill reproduces the wording of the Section 30 Order, and this means that it gives the Fund the broadest possible scope to operate within the reservation. But I want to say, you know, quite clearly, there is no barrier now or in, under the permanent arrangements for families under ex exceptional pressure accessing the welfare funds by virtue of the wording of the bill. And regulations and guidance will ensure that applications from this group continue to be given priority. Um, so the examples that were mentioned there by both Ken McIntosh and Margaret McDougall those examples were not, are not currently excluded uh, from the interim arrangements and will not be excluded under the permanent arrangements. The bill sets out a high-level framework for welfare funds and the details of how it will operate to be set out will be set out in regulations and statutory guidance. The current draft regulations that we produced to give an indication of the area that would be covered in regulations include families under exceptional pressure as one of the five circumstances in which a community care grant can be paid. And it's my intention to retain this in the regulations and to work with stakeholders such as the Child Poverty Action Group to ensure that the guidance for the permanent, uh, permanent arrangements captures the concerns of stakeholders and deals with them effectively. And finally, in relation to families under exceptional pressure, I think it's worth noting that the comparisons with the number of awards to families under exceptional pressure under the DWP Social Fund and under the Scottish Welfare Fund, like Ken McIntosh said, are not comparing like for like. There are significant differences between the Scottish Welfare Fund guidance and monitoring framework and that for the Social Fund. And to me, the acid test is where the money is going, and the Scottish Welfare Fund statistics show that under the interim scheme, 38% of households receiving community care grants contain children, whilst the figures for crisis grants is 30%. But under the old DWP scheme for 2012-13, 32% of households awarded community care grants were households with children, and for crisis grants, the proportion was only 16%. And I think this indicates that we're effectively targeting families under pressure now, and it's my belief that we'll continue to do so under the permanent arrangements, and I would therefore ask um, not to support Amendment 27. Okay, I'll come back to Ken McIntosh to wind up and to move and press or withdraw your amendment. Ken? Yeah. Thanks very much, Minister. And, and I have to say that was a, a far more encouraging discussion. Uh, it's quite clear that everybody around the table, Minister and all the members included, clearly want families facing exceptional pressure to receive support from the uh, welfare funds available, whether that be community care or crisis grants. And I was actually quite pleased to hear the statistics that the Minister quoted, uh, and I hope they're more accurate than the ones I was given from the SEDO and CPAC and others. Um, however, there's, there's, uh, there's also... Uh, the, the main argument, as far as I work out, um, and I thought Joan Malcalpine Malcal put it properly, that we want to support this amendment, um, but slightly concerned about the legislative competence. Uh, uh, she's tempted to say, so what? And I would urge her, in this case, to do so. But uh, um, the, the, uh, and the only, uh, that, as far as I work out, the only argument, against, the real argument against this was, was the legislative competence. And uh, I would just question whether or not uh, that would... Certainly, I would certainly question whether or not, in Kevin Stewart's word, the entire bill would fall in this amendment. It just would not happen. The, the key thing here is, uh, and the Minister didn't really address this, the Minister said that anybody could bring a challenge. Now, that's a theoretical possibility. Who exactly is going to bring a challenge? The families who are being denied welfare? I don't think so. The, the local authorities? The local authorities, are they going to? The, is the government going to bring? Who exactly is going to bring this challenge on the basis that families under exceptional pressure is included in this. And if I may say so as well, the, local, the Minister, and again, I'm not going to stop her doing so, the Minister currently has in guidance five categories which includes, specifically includes, to help families facing exceptional pressure. And she repeated her assurance that she'll include this in regulations. Well, if I may say so, 
If the Minister believes she has the authority to put it in regulations and that that should be implemented by local authorities, what authority is she quoting? Because the only authority that this Parliament has comes through the, Scottish, the, the very act that she's quoting. In other words, if it's out with the legislative competence to be included in the face of this bill, because it's not a Section 30 order, it's out with the legislative competence of the Minister to put it in regulations. And there is no difference between the two, because the same... We get our power through statute, and you can't quote one against this bill and then quote the other and say it's better off in regulation. If the argument applies to regulation, it applies to the face of the bill. And if the Minister wishes to come back, I'd be quite happy to... Minister, if you want to. I mean, I, I, I say this, I, I, I am not a, a, a legal person. I know that the, the legal people are not able to, to, to comment now at this stage in the, the, the process. However, it is a subsection of what's in the bill, and I'm told legally that is the competent way to do it. Now, what I am willing to say today, and I don't know if I can now that I've moved things, is to, to, to look at this again and put it in more detail. But I want to be absolutely clear that we intend the Scottish Welfare Fund to help families with exceptional pressure and believe the way to do it is to ensure that we've got the bill right to meet the Section 30 order and get the regulations right as well. And that is our clear intention, that families for exceptional pressure will be assisted from the Scottish Welfare Fund, of the Welfare Fund Scotland Bill. Okay, Ken, do you want to... See, I, I, I am very reassured by the Minister's intentions and her words. Uh, I hope she won't mind, however, if I put this to the vote and test it again. Um, the motion... Oh, sorry, the amendment having been moved, uh, I put it to the committee. So the question is that Amendment 27 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Okay, those in favour of Amendment 27, please indicate. And those against... That's four votes against, uh, three votes for, so Amendment 27 falls. I now call Amendment 1 in the name of the Minister, and it's in a group on its own, Minister, to move and speak to Amendment 1. OK, thank you, Convener. Amendment 1 has been proposed in response to evidence that the committee heard during Stage 1 in respect of concerns regarding the wording of Section 5.2.F of the Bill. Section 5.2.F relates to regulation making powers about the circumstances in which amounts may require to be repaid or recovered in respect of assistance that has been provided through a welfare fund. Concerns were raised that this regulation making power could be used at a later date to allow local authorities to administer loans through the welfare funds. This was never the intention, and I have always been clear that awards under the welfare funds should not be provided in the form of loans. And Amendment 1 puts this intention beyond any doubt by specifying that local authorities may not use welfare funds to make loans. The amendment? Okay, I move Minister. Amendment 1. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, does anyone want to contribute to the debate? Ken? I think it's just worth noting that uh, I'm pleased the Minister uh, recognised this was flagged up to the committee. The committee um, put it in a report and I'm very pleased the Minister has recognised it. I think we're all pleased at, at the whole intention of the Bill to move from loans to grants and I think we should support this amendment. Okay. Minister, do you want to make other comments? I don't see any other. Okay. The question is then, Amendment 1 be agreed? Are we all agreed? Yes. Uh, that's been agreed. I call Amendment 28 in the name of Ken McIntosh, which has already been debated, with <coughs> Amendment 25. Uh, Ken McIntosh to move or no? It's not moved. Uh, that then brings us to the question that Section 2 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yeah. I now call Amendment 2 in the name of the Minister, which is grouped with Amendment 8. Minister to move uh, Amendment 2 and to speak to both amendments in this group. OK, thank you. Amendments 2 and 8 are, are linked, and Amendment 2 removes Section 3 of the Bill, which relates to outsourcing of welfare funds and joint working across local authorities. The intention behind Section 3 of the Bill was to allow local authorities to outsource provision of welfare funds. I never envisaged this power being used to allow private sector companies to administer welfare funds. However, concerns were raised during Stage 1 regarding the possibility of the provision of welfare funds been outsourced to the private sector. As the Scottish Government's response to the Committee's Stage 1 report pointed out, it's not possible to specify in the face of the Bill that outsourcing should be restricted to third sector organisations only. 
so the options available to me were to retain Section 3, which would leave open the possibility of outsourcing to the private sector or remove the relevant provisions. And given the strength of feeling that was expressed against private sector companies administrating the welfare funds, I believe that removing the option to outsource is the right thing to do. By removing all of the Section 3 references to local authorities, jointly administering welfare funds are being removed from the bill. However, this amendment would not prevent local authorities making arrangements to administer welfare funds jointly since Section 56.5 of the Local Government Scotland Act 1973 provides a general power for two or more local authorities to discharge functions jointly. I move Amendment 2. Okay. No one appears to... Well, Annabelle, sorry. Can I just clarify uh, with the Minister... Would the effect of this amendment also be to exclude charitable organisations? Yes. Yes, that, that would be the effect. And the, there was um, arguments for charitable organisations themselves, who, who third sector, who said it's not something they would wish to do. Um, there is no way to ident separate it out. I think I, I made that clear. It was removing it totally or not removing, and there was a strong strength of feeling that we could not leave that in, as it would allow um, it could allow private organisations to administer the funds. Um, thank you, Peter, and I am pleased that uh, this uh, it has been moved by the minister. Um, and uh, Ms Goldie makes a point about the third sector uh, and while none uh, of the, the committee um, were in favour of any private company taking over the running of welfare funds, uh, we did talk about the third sector, uh, but we had eventually built into the report the fact that that may fall foul of European Union uh, procurement rules. Uh, and I think the best way to ensure that there are no challenges uh, at all uh, is to uh, remove that provision. That still gives, of course, uh, local authorities the ability to run funds jointly, uh, which some smaller authorities uh, may wish to do. And I think it's right uh, and logical that that be left in. But I, I'm glad that the Minister has moved what she had, because if, uh, if we had been left in a situation where third sector could apply, we may have faced challenges from uh, various bodies under EU procurement rules. Ken? Uh, thanks very much. I also want to welcome the Minister's remarks again uh, for listening both to the evidence and to the committee. In fact, in this case, particularly for listening to the minority of the committee uh, and, and our recommendation rather than to uh, the specific uh, majority vote of the committee. Uh, and I, I would commend the Minister for uh, using common sense in this case. Can I, can I ask the Minister, has there been specific legal advice obtained by the Scottish Government that the bill is currently framed would contravene European law. I mean, we certainly haven't a specific uh, advice on that, but it's about the levels that charitable organisations are able to bid under procurement. Uh, that we'd have to look at. And the, the reason that, that I would have to say, the main reason that we, we took this out of the bill was because of the strong strength of feeling within committee members, the parliament, when it came through stage one as well and indicated I was doing this, and also it, within the third sector organisations themselves, arguing very strongly that we shouldn't have a provision for outsourcing in the bill with the potential going to the private sector. Minister, it's for you to wind up the debate, so if you want to... I have nothing further to comments. add to that. OK. Um, the question is then, amendment... To, uh, sorry, did, did you move the amendment just to be on the safe side? You? I, I move the amendment. OK, um, thanks. I'm just making sure so we don't, <laughs> we don't get these things wrong. Uh, in that case, um, the question is that amendment to be agreed to are well agreed. No, yes. No, I think there's a point of principle about the freedom of local authorities, so I do not support the amendment. OK. Um, I put it to a vote then. Uh, all those in favour of Amendment 2? And those against? And that's six votes to one, so Amendment 2 is agreed to. And that brings us to Amendment 3 in the name of the Minister, grouped with Amendments 5, 9 and 10. 
Minister to move Amendment 3 and speak to all other amendments in the group. This grouping of amendments covers local authority review of decisions they have made on welfare fund applications. Amendment 3 creates a right of review of a local authority decision. This replaces a previous provision in the Bill which provided that Ministers may make regulations in this area. Amendment 3 allows, also allows Ministers to make regulations setting out the circumstances in which a local authority decision on a welfare funds application does not have to be reviewed, how applications for review should be made and setting time limits within which applications should be made. Amendment 9 is made in consequence of Amendment 3. The substance of the provision that is removed by Amendment 9 is recreated in the regulation-making powers that will be provided by Amendment 3. Both the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee and this committee called for regulations made under the Bill to be subject to affirmative procedure due to the fact that much of the detail of how welfare funds will operate will be set out in regulations and guidance. Amendment 5 changes the procedure for regulations made under Section 4, which, subject to these amendments being accepted, will relate only to reviews undertaken by local authorities from negative to affirmative procedure. Amendment 10 enables ministers to make provision in regulations setting out the procedure local authorities should follow in relation to reviews, applications for reviews and the timescales that would allow to apply to them when carrying out reviews. In summary, this group covers a range of amendments which are intended to clarify how the Scottish Government will approach setting out the framework that local authority reviews should operate in and I move Amendment 3. Okay. Members wish to comment. Okay. Minister, if you want to add anything that further to add, can you? Okay. Thanks. Um, that means that we move to the question uh, that is that Amendment 3 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. That's agreed. I therefore call Amendment 4 in the name of the Minister, which is grouped with other amendments as shown in the groupings. Minister, t uh, to move Amendment 4 and to speak to all of those amendments. Thank you. The amendments in this grouping relate to the role of the Scottish Public Service Ombud Services Ombudsman in undertaking independent review of local authority decisions on welfare funds applications. The bill as introduced had very few provisions relating to the role of the Ombudsman. It was always our intention to come back at stage two with amendments following discussions with the Ombudsman and how best we set out their role in undertaking independent review. Amendments 4, 6, 7, 11, 13 and 16 don't alter the content or policy intention of the Bill, but are necessary to reflect structural changes to accommodate the substantive amendments that set out, this, out the specifics of the Ombudsman's role. Amendment 21 is a technical amendment specifying the definition of the Ombudsman for the purposes of the Act. Turning to the substantive amendments regarding the Ombudsman, Amendment 15 creates a right to review by the Ombudsman of a local authority decision on a welfare funds application. It sets out when, how and by whom an application can be made and the timescales in which an application should be made. It provides for the Ombudsman to determine whether an application for independent review has been made and to make exceptions to the time bar on applying for independent review. Independent, uh, in, amendment 17 requires the Ombudsman to prepare a statement of practice setting out the approach which he intends to take in carrying out the review function under the Bill. He must consult local authorities and other persons as he considers appropriate before preparing and publishing such a statement, and if any revisions are to be made to the statement of practice. The Ombudsman already has the power to consider a complaint about the way a local authority has dealt with an application. The new power to review that application will not change this. The Ombudsman already has extensive powers to gather evidence in relation to complaints, and Amendment 18 provides, amongst other things, that broadly the same powers will apply to reviews. And this is important because the legislation means that the Ombudsman will have two jurisdictions over the welfare funds. The Ombudsman will be able to deal with complaints and reviews, in practical terms, it would be difficult for him if the Ombudsman obtained information in relation to a review but didn't have the power to use that information in relation to a, client, a complaint about the same application or vice versa. This would be particularly problematic if the same document contained evidence relevant to a complaint 
and evidence relevant to review, or if the same people were required to give evidence in both relation to a complaint and a review. On the theme of matching the Ombudsman's current powers, Amendment 19 replicates for reviews of welfare funds decisions the power he has in the Scottish Public Services Ombudsman Act 2002 in relation to obstruction and contempt by people providing information in connection with a complaint investigation. And going back to Amendment 18, it also gives the Ombudsman powers to hold oral hearings and make rules about when an oral hearing should be would be appropriate and the procedure to be followed. The Ombudsman would have powers to administer oaths at these hearings. Where the Ombudsman makes rules in relation to hearings, he must consult local authorities and any other persons he, con he considers appropriate and must subsequently publish these rules. While hearings are likely to be extremely rare, it's important this option is available. We have been advised by the Ombudsman that this scheme does not need to comply with European Court of Human Rights requirements but ensuring that hearings are available when needed and also that rules are made about these ensures that this legislation does meet that standard. Amendment 20 requires the Ombudsman to notify the applicant and the local authority of the result of a review. It also provides that the Ombudsman may publish a report of the review. It doesn't require this in every case, but for unusual cases, it will be beneficial for stakeholders to be aware of the Ombudsman's view. This section also places limits on what information the Ombudsman can publish, and this is to protect the identity of those involved. Amendment 10 to 2 provides for consequential amendments to the Scottish Public Service Ombudsman Act 2002 to ensure read across between the powers the Ombudsman will obtain under this Act and current powers the Ombudsman has under the 2002 Act. These include obstruction, defamation, reporting, disclosure of the information by the Ombudsman and confidentiality. Amendment 22 also contains provisions in relation to confidentiality, which will allow the Ombudsman to use information gathered in consideration of a review in order to inform the investigation of a complaint and vice versa. The final part of the amendment updates the interpretation provision of the 2002 Act as a result of the changes made to the Act, that Act by this Bill. Amendment 22 reduces the risk of a situation where the Ombudsman holds information but cannot use it and indeed needs to try to make a decision on the basis that he hasn't seen it. It also means local authorities have some clarity too as they will know that a request from the Ombudsman for information has the same status whether it's a complaint or a review. While it's important for practical purposes to ensure the information gathering provisions are the same, local authorities should be reassured that the requirements about what the Ombudsman can take complaints about and ensuring they have a chance to respond to complaints before a final decision will, will, is made will remain. And I was pleased to note that during Stage 1 pr proceedings there was support for the Ombudsman taking on the independent review function for welfare fund decisions. Accordingly, I trust that the committee members will support these amendments. I move Hello. Amendment 4. Okay, thanks, Minister. Uh, I'll open up to the committee and go to Ken to be followed by Christina. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Convener. I've just got one uh, query, which is about the powers over obstruction and contempt uh, listed in, in Amendment 19. Uh, Child Poverty Action Group flagged this up. They, they felt that the powers here, which are uh, to, uh, to take a proceeding to the court of session and um, where somebody didn't provide information to that would constitute contempt of court, that this was a bit extreme for such a relatively minor and quite technical matter. Under the old system, under the uh, social fund, there were no such powers. If somebody doesn't, uh, doesn't, um, doesn't provide information and doesn't uh, wish to participate in the process, the, the local authority can make the decision anyway. It doesn't need to take action against them. They can just reach a decision. Uh, in this case, they, 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 they are you know, talking about taking it, threatening to take them to the court of session and contempt of court. For, when we're talking about vulnerable people here who may not understand or may be scared, you know, uh, and I have to say th this seems way too heavy handed. Uh, uh, the, the argument the minister, excuse me for this, the, the argument the minister seemed to put was she was assured by the ombudsman that he needs these powers. Well, that doesn't strike me as a particularly convincing argument. That's a bit like the chief constable telling us that police need to have, wear guns at all times. You know, it's not 
It's not for him to decide, it's for us to decide, for the Minister. So I would just ask her, do we really need this? We've, we've had the social fund operated for years without any of these powers whatsoever, no difficulty. Why are we introducing such huge powers for the Ombudsman? We've got concerns about it anyway. And I would ask her maybe mm -hmm. to reconsider Article uh, Amendment 19. Maybe come to this the, the opposite point of view from my, my, my colleague Ken. One of the, the issues that I have uh, uh, in a constituency level is the element of trust that people have in the system. Um, and I have many people who feel as if you know they have not had a fair hearing. I welcome um, the um, proposal to, to put in the review because I think the review is very, very important. I think for that to be done independently from the local authority is, is very important as well. I think on the human rights aspect of it, anything that has an appeal mechanism for me appeals because it should do um, to ensure that people are getting the, the, the fairest of treatment and build then build that trust back into the system. I think um, Duncan Dunlop and the, the evidence um, of which I wasn't here to, to hear, but I've managed to try and catch up with the, the, the stage one evidence. He, he said that, you know, people don't have trust in a system where they've been rejected one time to go back to that system again and have any confidence in that. And I think that that's what, what they need to have and, and that's what these amendments give. A couple of questions I've got is um, around about local authorities. Can they be compelled to give information? to the Ombudsman, should um, that be uh, the case? Um, and what would be the timescale for that? Because certainly my experience is that if people do you know, attempt to appeal or they go to citizen advice or they go to other organisations for support and reapplication or appeal, then the length of time that takes can put great pressure. Um, and certainly at that point in time, maybe people aren't um, receiving any funds at all at that time. So um, the timescale for that as well, because I mean, not all local authorities, but certainly some that I know would, would drag out that process in the hope that the person would just drop it. Um, and that's a concern I've got. So I've come from a, sort of a different point of view from, from Ken on this and the, the need for the Ombudsman to be there. Thanks. Minister, do you want to wind up uh, uh, and uh, add any comments? And a couple of things. I think I would say, and, 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 and this all came up, you know, when the Ombudsman came at, at stage one as well, um, that all of this was done in, um, we've been under negotiation for some considerable time with the Ombudsman Service uh, about, and this is why it's on the bill, because we wanted to do some of this in regulation, but that was felt as they're independent, that wasn't appropriate. So there has been a lot of negotiation going on for some considerable time with the Ombudsman about t t taking on this, this role as um, independent uh, decision makers are making a, a that appeal can go to. Um, in terms of the point that, that Ken McIntosh raised about, you know, the extreme cases in, in court of session, uh, uh, certainly that is not, so, I mean, I absolutely agree, it's not something I would think is, is appropriate in terms of some of the vulnerable people that we are dealing with. The Ombudsman requested that on the basis that they're required to have it because it matches the other powers they have um, in some of their other functions. I, I am more than willing to, to go back and look at them again if the committee is saying that they're not happy with that particular power. But we have taken a long time to negotiate with the Ombudsman to get them to agree to take on this role that they want to be able to maintain their independence. They want their functions to be clear across the board with the services that they provide. And, and that's the reason why um, that's it, that's in there, and and I absolutely you know accept that, that it does seem a very extreme um, situation and one that I would hope would never be um, used in the circumstances as as you outlined. Um, in, in terms of Christina McKelvey's point, the ombudsman is required to draw up how they will handle appeals, and they are very aware that time scales required to be on this, that and local authorities will be required to supply them with evidence, um, if the, the Ombudsman requests that evidence, then local authorities will be obliged to supply it. And we're very aware and, and think it can be done fairly quickly, some of it through electronic means, and the Ombudsman is working on that just now about the time scales they will be looking at. But they know their decision making has got to be quick as well, because we are talking about vulnerable people very often in crisis and in, in crisis situations. OK. Uh -huh. I'm just checking again, Minister, that you, you moved that amendment. I if did you don't move. mind um, I did, doing so, yes. yeah. Um, that means that we go to uh, the question on Amendment 4. Uh, is Amendment 4 agreed? Yes. yes. That's 
agreed by the committee. I call Amendment 5 in the name of the Minister already debated with Amendment 3. The Minister to move formally. Moved. The question is then Amendment 5 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. agreed? And the question then is that Section 4 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. I call Amendments 6, 7, 8, 9 and 10 all in the name of the Minister and all previously debated. And I invite the Minister to move Amendments 6 to 10 on block. Moved. And ask members whether they object to a single question being put on Amendment 6 to 10. No. Okay. If no member objects, then the, the question is that Amendment 6 to 10 are agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. I call Amendment 29 in the name of Ken McIntosh and it's a group on its own. Ken McIntosh to move and speak to Amendment 29. Uh, thank you very much, Convener. The effect of this amendment is to ensure that decisions on an application for a crisis grant should be made immediately where possible, or if not, then by the end of the next working day. And as committee members will know from the evidence we heard, under the interim Scottish Welfare Fund scheme, local authorities have 48 hours in which to process a claim. However, under the previous DWP scheme, that deadline was 24 hours. Now, this first issue, this issue first came to my attention uh, when we heard evidence and figures were presented to this committee, which revealed that the interim fund was not as timious in meeting <coughs> applicants' needs as the previous scheme had been. It's a point that's been echoed by the SCVO, who would urge ministers to take all action necessary to ensure 24-hour processing times become the norm, uh, by quarriers, who I think we quoted in our own report, because they were particularly worried that if this 48-hour deadline applied over a weekend, then uh, you know, an applicant made on a Friday or a Thursday might not be processed till late on a Monday. But I thought the strongest uh, evidence and arguments came from uh, the CAB, who described their, the Citizens Advice Bureau, who described their practical experience. And they said that in the experience of their advisors, applications for crisis loans made over the phone were processed very quickly by the DWP. Delay was sometimes caused by difficulties getting through on the phone in the first place, but once connected, the process was generally very quick and decisions were often made at the end of the initial phone call. And the claimant just told where to, to collect uh, that day. And this happens with some, though not all, SWF crisis grant applications. And they point that the figures which show that the, the, within, within two days, the, the figures for the old system uh, using the 48-hour backstop uh, crisis loan statistics show 98.5% of payments under the DWP compared to 94% under the SWF. Now, CAB advisors also suspected, and this is more anecdotal, that any lengthy delays processing crisis loan applications, that's under the old system, were more likely to have related to the need for a decision about whether the applicant would be able to repay the loan, rather than it's not about their eligibility or the priority and so on. And clearly, that's not an issue. In other words, it's counterintuitive to think that the new system should be slower than the old system. If anything, it should be another way around. Uh, and uh, uh, they uh, concluded that they were, there was no implicit reason that processing times should be uh, um, relating to crisis grants should be any longer than they were for crisis loans. And they believe that if you actually put in a 48-hour, in regulation, if you put in a 48-hour time limit, once all relevant information is received, it may actually lead some decision makers to request evidence when it's not needed. In other words, that although it's clearly not the Minister's intention, the Minister's made it abundantly clear that she expects all decisions to be as soon as possible. By putting in a 48-hour backstop, the 48-hour backstop actually becomes the target rather than the backstop. And so it inadvertently has the intention of slowing down the process rather than speeding it up. So uh, I would urge uh, members to support this amendment, which would uh, replace the 48-hour backstop with the original 24-hour one. And I move the amendment in my okay. Thanks, Kent. I'll open it up to the committee. If you want to. Annabelle, you want to comment? I was Mr McIntosh. If I'm, it sounds quite technical, but if I understand your proposition correctly, this is actually to, to put the situation onto the proven DWP position, which has worked effectively on a 24-hour basis. Thank you. Uh, convener, I think we've got to take cognizance of the fact that the former system was a loan system uh, and not a grant system. Uh, and what the local authority must do uh, is manage their funding effectively and ensure that the proper checks have been made, or else we will have a situation 
uh, whereby it may well be uh, that folks um, are receiving grants uh, which they don't pay back um, who should not be getting those grants at certain points. Um, and, you know, I think, I think that we have got to be very careful here. The Minister has already said, and I would like her uh, to indicate again today, that she will do everything possible to ensure um, that, uh, that the grants are paid uh, as timiously as possible. Having spoken to folk in local authorities, uh, I know that that is what they are striving to do. What I would be scared of is if we uh, if we move uh, and set a timeline which is uh, lower than the current one, uh, we might actually uh, lead to a situation where folks are not actually getting uh, the uh, the awards uh, that they need uh, and deserve. Okay, Margaret. Um. You know, I mean, I heard what the minister said that, or was it Ken who said that DWP decisions were made very quickly uh, on occasions, and I'm not saying they, they are always made very quickly, but certainly they, they could be made quickly. Um, and that we are moving to a, a grant system rather than a loan system, therefore there shouldn't necessarily be the same uh, requirement for a investigation to see whether or not they can pay back a loan. So they should therefore be able to process these applications quicker. I, and I think the 24 hours should be met rather than extending it to 48. Uh, before coming to you, Minister, I just wanted to make a, a comment on this. When we did debate this quite extensively in the um, the stage one report and, and you were very clear in your uh, view that this would be an improvement and you, you gave examples from your own experience, I think, uh, when you worked in that, that sector of the DWP taking up to three weeks uh, to collate the information and then the, the, the one day or the 24 hour decision making period only kicking in uh, at the end of that, that period. And you, you clearly gave the impression that you thought that this process would be quicker and that the, the 48 hour process would allow uh, decisions to be made more swiftly, but evidence that was subsequently received indicated that the process for collating information is very similar between the local authorities and the DWP, and that actually going from a 24-hour to 48-hour decision-making process could extend the period because the 24-hour decision-making process as is, uh, or as was with the DWP, would not alter. It would be exactly the same. The collation of information still takes and can take days. Now, you, you would not want it to take longer than that, but the, the time period for the decision only kicks in once the information has been collated. So I can't understand why moving from 24 hours to 48 hours uh, would speed that process up, because the collation of information is taking exactly the same amount of time. And in the evidence that we received, it, it could in some cases be longer. Okay. Over to you, Minister, to wind up the debate. Okay, well, I mean, Amendment 29 seeks to impose a deadline on processing times, and I know that some users of the interim funds suggested that local authorities weren't processing applications as quickly as they should, and this has led to a call to introduce a legislative requirement for processing. And we've been clear from the very start of the interim fund that speed is key because of the risk of harm to applicants. The guidance in the interim fund requires local authorities to process a crisis grant as soon as possible, and it requires that urgent applications for living expenses be prioritised. The maximum processing time of two working days is to make it clear that long processing times are not acceptable. It is in no way a target in waiting times. And we know that under the interim fund, 64% of crisis grants are processed on the same working day, and that a further 24% are processed the next day. And I've spoken personally to staff who have demonstrated dedication and commitment in dealing with all crisis grant applications to process them within the day, especially on Fridays, so that applicants are not left in crisis for extended periods. And I'm mindful that local authorities have a complex job to do in considering an application, assessing eligibility and need, gathering and recording evidence to support their decision, and considering and organising the other forms of support that the applicant might benefit from. I don't think that this is more complex 
I do think actually it's more complex than just assess, assessing the affordability as was with the, the crisis loans. It was simply could they afford to pay it back. In setting timescales, we need to recognise that a short target decision time could result in less scrutiny of cases and a poorer understanding of the applicant's situation. And the move from crisis loans under the Social Fund to grants under the Scottish Welfare Fund means, as was said by Kevin Stewart, the funds are not recoverable and local authorities are therefore required to carefully balance their obligation to manage their budgets effectively and ensure that proper checks have been made uh, and with a quick turnaround for applicants, they've got to be satisfied that they're awarding grants to those who need them most. But as the committee is aware, along with COSLA, we are monitoring the quality of decisions made by local authorities, including processing times, as part of our quality improvement measures and continue to share good practice across local authorities. As we make the transition to permanent funds, we will continue to work with local authorities, focus, focusing on the importance of quick, sound decision-making, with the aim of increasing the number of applications processed within 24 hours. We will also be carefully considering target processing times as the regulations are developed, and that is where I believe any target or processing time should be set, not in the face of the bill, but in regulations, as in the 48 hours that, that Ken McIntosh referred to are actually in the draft regulations and not, not in the face of the bill. And I think the regulations are the place for processing times. And we are certainly, uh, you know, that is something that we will be looking at as we develop the regulations. And it will be an area we want to consult actively as regulations require a hard and fast timescale rather than the more considered report approach we have in the guidance at present. And as I've just outlined, it is a complex issue. So in summary, I don't believe that we should effectively, effectively set a timescale for processing applications in the bill, as this amendment seeks to do. I believe we should think carefully about the issue, consult more widely as we develop the regulations and guidance that will, that will be produced under the bill. And for that reason, I urge the committee not to support Amendment 20, 29. OK, I come back then to Ken McIntosh to press or withdraw and wind up the debate. Uh, thank you very much, convener. And uh, again, I welcome some of the comments uh, I've heard. Quite interesting uh, discussion this morning, um, some of the things we've heard. Uh, Annabel Goldie revealed, and I'm sure this is a first on this committee, that yes, the DWP did this better than the Scottish Government. <laughs> That's got to be a first at this committee, I'm sure. But yes, the, the, the old system, the social fund, uh, has a better record at paying out. I mean, this is, we're talking about people in crisis. We're talking about people, and I'm sure every single MP, MSP around this table has had the, the calls on the Friday afternoon when the social work office is closed and people come in in desperate needs and where do I go now? And this happens all the time. The old DWP system was a very prompt system. In fact, originally, I don't think it had any time scale in it. It was meant to be an immediate decision and they introduced the 24-hour uh, deadline because to try and speed them up. We're now, we're now you know, putting in a 48-hour one, which inadvertently, whatever the Minister's intention, it could slow them down. Uh, Kevin Stewart, I'm not sure I followed Kevin Stewart's argument. But apart from the fact he sounded more like George Osborne than John Swinney, which was very interesting, uh, and has an old warning, um, he, he particularly said that, uh, he talked about the importance of paying back grants. I, I assume that was just a slip of the tongue. Um, clearly, these are grants, not loans, and they don't need to be paid back. Okay, well, in that case, it was a slip of the tongue, so I, I accept that. But I, I, didn't follow, I did not follow his logic whatsoever. Thank Margaret McDougall Shall put the point right. Again? And give you the logic. Uh, I, I will. I'd be happy uh, to, Mr. Stewart, uh, correct yourself from the previous mistake. I, I think one of the key things in all of this is that we did have a loan system before uh, from the DWP, and folk did pay back. This is a grant system. I think that, uh, as the Minister has rightly pointed out, folks have got to make sure uh, that uh, those applicants are eligible for those grants, and they are dealing with them as promptly as they possibly can. That is certainly the case in the local authority uh, that I cover in Aberdeen. Uh, and I think one of the things which I think you know could happen um, if you put this uh, on the face of the bill is it may well be that the decision makers feeling under pressure and not having all of the information that they feel that they need in front of them may actually reject an application of someone who is actually in need. I, I fail to follow that argument. Well, uh, Mr. Mr. Stewart often confuses assertion with argument, uh, uh, and in this case, I don't follow his argument whatsoever. In the previous case, 
Of course local authorities, I, I fully accept that local authority officials are trying to do the best job. You know, I'm sure they're doing the best job under the DWP and currently. Uh, it's a difficult job, but we should try and make it easier. And if they don't have to assess affordability of paying back loans, then they've actually got one less criteria to meet, one less assessment to make, and it should be faster, a point that Margaret McDougall and the convener both made. Now, if I may say so, I think, just to return to the point that the Minister made several times, which I, I absolutely recognise, that the point of the system is to address people's needs at a point of crisis, mm -hmm. and that the Minister is very keen that this is done as, as speedily as, and timorously as possible. Mm -hmm. And I do accept that. I do accept that as the intention. I am slightly worried that it won't have the effect. Uh, I was, again, very pleased that she's going to consult more widely, that she's going to look at the uh, possibility of addressing this in regulations. So I'm very pleased for the <coughs> I was very pleased to hear uh, those remarks and uh, our thank Minister for, for, for making that commitment. Uh, but I still believe that until we actually see that in practice, I think it's important that we th th this committee expresses a view and I would like to move the amendment in my name. Okay. The question then is that Amendment 29 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Okay. Uh, those in favour of Amendment 29? And those against? So that's four... Votes against, three votes for, Amendment 29 falls. I call Amendment 11 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 4, Minister to move formally. Moved. The question is then, Amendment 11 be agreed to, are we all agreed? Yes. And I call Amendment 12 in the name of the Minister, which is in a group on its own, Minister to speak to Amendment 12. Uh, thank you. Amendment 12 makes regulations under Section 5 subject to the affirmative <coughs> procedure. Regulations under Section 5 will set out, in conjunction with the guidance we will produce under the Act, the detail of how welfare funds are to operate. This change is in response to calls from both the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee and this committee for regulations made under the Bill to be subject to affirmative procedure, and I move Amendment 12. Any comments from the committee? Minister, back to you if you've got anything else that you want to... Nothing further. Okay. Uh, the question then is that Amendment 12 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. It's agreed. And the question is that Section 5 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. So I now call Amendment 30 in the name of Kevin Stewart, already debated with Amendment 24. Kevin Stewart to move or not move? Move. Okay. The question is that Amendment 30 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? I call Amendment 13 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 4. Minister, to move formally. Moved. And the question is that Amendment 13 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Okay. I call Amendment 14 in the name of the Minister, which is in a group on its own. Minister, to move and speak to Amendment 14. Okay. Amendment 14 adds the Ombudsman to the list of bodies that Scottish Ministers must consult before issuing, varying or revoking guidance produced under the Act. This amendment has been brought forward in response to, the rec to a recommendation made by the committee in its Stage 1 report. As the Ombudsman will have to interpret the guidance when carrying out his review function, it is right that he should have the opportunity to be aware of and comment on any changes that are proposed to the guidance. I move Amendment 14. Any comments from the committee? Okay, question. Our Minister, do you want to say anything else? Nothing further. Uh, the question then is that Amendment 14 be agreed to or well agreed. Okay. I call, oh, sorry. Um, the question is that Section 6 therefore be agreed to or be agreed. Yes. I call Amendments 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21 and 22, all in the name of the Minister and all previously debated. I invite the Minister to move Amendments 15 to 22 on block. Well, I was going to come to a point, uh, mm -hmm. Ken, they can all be moved on block, but I want to um, separate out some of the amendments to be voted on on block and, and some singularly, if that's all right. Uh, I was going to suggest that we uh, agree to a single question on uh, uh, amendments 15 to 18, if members are agreed. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I've moved then, to, if they're all agreed. I'll, I'll put the, the question then that amendments 15 to 18 be agreed to. And then yes. Uh, amendment 19. Uh, 19 before stage three uh, and discuss it with the Ombudsman as well. Um, 
as outlined earlier in Ken McIntosh's discussion. But you, you've moved to the motion. Have I moved it? Yeah. But you can withdraw it. You can withdraw it. Do you want I'll, to? Withdraw? I'll withdraw it, and uh, I'm I'm not saying I'll not bring it back at stage three. But at this point, I'm willing to withdraw it and have more discussion on it. Okay. Well, I just object. check with the committee then that we're content yeah. for the minister to withdraw amendment nineteen. Yeah. yeah. Very good. Yeah. Okay, and uh, that allows us then to go to amendments 20, 21 and 22, which I'll uh, vote on on block, if members are agreed. Yes, <coughs> Are members agreed then to amendments 20 to 22? Agreed. Yes, agreed. agreed. Find the next vote. I call Amendment 31 in the name of Margaret McDougall, which is a group on its own. Margaret McDougall to move and speak to Amendment 31. Thank you, Convener. Um, Amendment 31 relates to an annual report. Specifically, it requests that the Scottish Government should prepare an initial report giving information about the delivery of welfare funds. The initial report should be before Parliament on or before the 30th of June 2016 with subsequent reports being laid before Parliament on or before the same date annually. The initial report should include information on the following, the amount paid out of the welfare fund, the number of applications for assistance in pursuance of Section 2 that have been received, and the number of applications rejected, and where financial assistance was provided and where assistance, and where assistance was provided. This information is the bare minimum that the report must include, and Scottish Go Minister can include additional information if it considers it appropriate. This is a pretty self-explanatory amendment that allows the Parliament to conduct proper scrutiny of how the Welfare Fund is performing and its effectiveness. It promotes openness and transparency, and I would argue it is just a matter of good practice to make sure that these statistics are kept on record and re reported to Parliament annually. In particular, I think it would be useful for the data to include how many cases were given financial assistance and how many were given assistance in kind, given you know what we've been discussing uh, this morning. And, and uh, while this practice may be occurring, this amendment will ensure it is part of the annual report and will enshrine the annual report in legislation. Consistent annual reporting would allow us to see what is and isn't working while keeping Parliament updated. I would ask the committee to support this amendment, even if it is solely on the principle of good practice. I move the amendment in my name. Thanks, Margaret. I will open up to the committee to make comments. Ken. Thanks. Yeah, I'd like to speak in favour of this uh, particular amendment. Uh, I, I think it is important that the Minister uh, and the Parliament, in fact, has the opportunity to keep this matter under review. The Minister, um, I think it's probably worth mentioning that the, uh, uh, perhaps restating this point, that this, um, this bill it, it receives our, it's difficult sometimes to tell this from the way we're exchanging uh, comments in the, in the amendment stage, but this bill has received widespread support uh, certainly from uh, colleagues from all parties and certainly within the Labour Party. And the Minister's approach to it has been broadly welcome. She's been very transparent in uh, the way that she's reviewed it and involved the voluntary sector and others in making sure that the interim scheme uh, was effective before drawing up the statutory scheme. And I think the key point here is to make sure that approach continues. So I don't doubt that the Minister will continue to keep this matter under review. But there are all sorts of issues about gatekeeping, about who actually... You know, gatekeeping, in other words, um, local authorities... Uh, putting people off from applying because they don't think they'll actually meet the criteria rather than assessing them formally. Um, and about uh, uh, who exactly uh, is drawing on these funds and calling on them. Uh, for example, we had a, a slight, um, uh, not disagreement, but uh, slightly different takes on whether or not families were able, vulnerable families were able to access these funds. So I think it's important not just that the Minister commits to this, which she already is, but that she does so formally and that because she does so formally, that will involve the Parliament, and the Parliament will have a role in that. Just remember, remind ourselves again, we're starting out on a new path here in Scotland where we're getting more and more responsibility for welfare powers. And I think it's quite important that we set, um, as we did earlier, set the principles in place early. Uh, the, the government actually already um, 
I believe, put in place uh, exactly this uh, this idea that we have an annual report in its welfare reform bill. I can't remember. I haven't got the date already. In other words, it's got a report already in place in one of the bills, one of the measures that passed in 2012. So all, all we're effectively asking is that the minister um, repeats that practice and puts in an annual report for this bill. And I think it would be welcomed by all sides and all, all those involved in the sector. Followed by Claire. Thank you very much, Katina. Yeah, I think we would all agree that we would want the, the fund monitored, but my understanding is that the Scottish Government already has an established statistical, always a tricky word, a monitoring framework, um, which covers the information um, that the amendment suggests should be in the annual report. And in addition to that, I think, I think we all know that this Parliament will scrutinise uh, the fund as, as will Civil, Civic Scotland, not, not least as the new welfare uh, powers are devolved. Um, it's a, a, a green principle with Joan. We all want um, um, scrutiny and openness in, in, in what we do in government, but my understanding is that this is already covered, and I would welcome the Minister's comments in that area, and also to comment on, on what um, uh, local authorities might be reporting and what the Ombudsman might be reporting, given that they've all come in to the scope of this as well. Uh, thank you, um, and. Uh, the committee uh, and the minister may be aware that, of course, just recently, uh, local government itself uh, have uh, put together a new suite uh, of, of benchmarks, uh, and I, I would hope that this one uh, could uh, be added to that suite of benchmarks. I think, you know, sometimes, uh, convener, uh, we have the habit of possibly over bureaucratizing things and actually that leading to less scrutiny uh, because, you know, you see the same things time and time again. I think it is the job of this committee, of this parliament, uh, to ensure that the current uh, monitoring that is taking place is scrutinized on a regular basis. I'm quite sure uh, that the public uh, will do likewise. Um, and uh, uh, as my colleague uh, Joan McAlpine says, um, that's something uh, that we are going to have to do more and more as new wel welfare powers come to this parliament. Unfortunately, uh, they are not all of the welfare powers that I would have liked to have seen come here. Annabelle. It seems to me that this is a, a genuine attempt to provide transparency. This is a very important new system. And none of us is quite sure just how it will work in practice. We hope it will work well. I think this is a welcome proposal to try and assist all of us understanding how the system is working. And unless the minister were able to point to some impossible bureaucratic burden about the proposed timescales, but frankly, with electronic data now available, I don't see that that's insurmountable, then I'm very strongly drawn to supporting this amendment. Okay, go to the Minister to comment. Okay, well, regarding Amendment 31, um, I, I tend to agree with the views expressed uh, in the Welfare Reform Committee Stage 1 report, which recommended that ongoing monitoring was preferable to a review clause. We've put a lot of time and effort into establishing a statistical monitoring framework, which already captures the information that this amendment suggests we lay in a report before the Parliament. In fact, our latest quarterly publication, which contains significantly more detail than the reports this amendment process proposes, has been released this morning, and there's 91 pages, and we release this quarterly, and the detailed information is considerable and a lot more than was been asked for by Margaret McDougall. The current statistical monitoring, which we intend to continue under the permanent arrangements, provides an excellent mechanism for highlighting any issues that arise within the operation of the Scottish <coughs> Welfare Fund. In fact, some of the issues that were raised with the committee in Stage 1 evidence came directly from the quarterly statistics that we publish. Third sector organisations have already been actively scrutinising the published statistics and feeding back thoughts and concerns. We've also reported to several ad hoc, responded to several ad hoc requests for further information to assist with the scrutiny of the fund, and will continue to do this wherever possible. In conjunction with COSLA, we are undertaking a series of visits to local authorities to carry out observations of their casework. These visits, alongside the statistical publications, should allow for both local authorities and the Scottish Government to respond to issues as they arise. 
the introduction of an independent review of disputed local authority decisions by the Scottish Public Services Ombudsman also provides a mechanism for scrutiny of the operation of individual local authorities and any patterns in complaints and reviews that indicate unintended consequences of regulations and guidance. And I also envisage that the workings of the permanent arrangements will be subject to ongoing parliamentary scrutiny through the committee process and future consideration of Scottish Government budgets. It seems to me to be inconceivable that the operation of the permanent arrangements would not be subject to scrutiny from both Civic Scotland and the Parliament, as the Scottish Gar Parliament considers Scottish Government plans for implementing the new welfare-related powers that will flow from the Smith Commission process. In summary, I believe that sufficient opportunities for, for review exist through the Parliament Scot through the, through the Parliament, Scottish Government statistical publications and from the invaluable input we all have from the third sector in Scotland to mean that ongoing requirements, requirement to lay an annual review in Parliament is not going to add significantly to the knowledge we have and how welfare funds are operating and may indeed divert scarce resources from the established continuous improvement work that's taking place. On that basis, I would ask Margaret McDougall to withdraw Amendment 31. Okay, I'll come back to Margaret to wind up to press or withdraw her amendment. Margaret. Right, thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, I hear everything that has been said, but certainly the third sector have said that they do want this review to, to be taken forward. Um, and uh, they were disappointed that um, it was left out. So, I mean, and they say that the Welfare Fund is part of a wider welfare reform mitigation activity. It could form part of the ministerial requirement to report annually under the Welfare Reform Further Provision Scotland Act 2012. So, and the Clause 4 uh, allows for ministers to include whatever information they feel relevant in this report. I mean... I don't think it's asking that much more. If the information is already there, you're saying the information is already there and you're saying I'm not asking for any more. I, in actual fact, I, I did say that um, the, the Scottish Government could include, include what information it saw fit, but to include the specific ones that I mentioned. I, um, so, I mean, there is certainly, as I said, the third sector feel that this should be happening and also a uh, it would perhaps provide more consistency across local authorities if that information could be looked at in a re you know in one report and also if you're not minded to support this amendment um, what formal op opportunity to scrutinize would there be for the Scottish government uh, if you didn't have this uh, if the minister wants to respond, as Margaret is winding up. Um, uh, yes. I, I mean, I, simply, if, if I'm being asked to respond, I would say the opportunity is an opportunity like this and this committee to scrutinise. The, we, we're publishing statistics quarterly, which every quarter are looked at and scrutinised by all of the third sector and anyone else that wants to do so. So I, I'm saying we are absolutely transparent about the Scottish Welfare Fund and continue to be so, and we'll do it continuous monitoring rather than a once-a-year report. Okay, Margaret, do you want to finish off at that? Or you what you mean, if that therefore bring, brings it to, the, to this committee on a regular basis, um, that would suffice. So do you want to withdraw your amendment? Or do you want to press it? No, I want to press the amendment just to test it. In that case, uh, I have to ask the question of Amendment 31 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Okay, uh, those in favour of the amendment, please show. And those against. So that's four votes against, three votes for. The amendment falls. That brings us to Amendment 23 in the name of the Minister, and it's in the group on its own, the Minister, to move and speak to Amendment 23. OK, uh, thank you. Amendment 23 is a technical amendment. It removes the scope to make incidental, supplementary or consequential provision in orders made by Ministers to bring provisions of the Act into force. Provisions in, provision in these areas can be made in respect of Sections 1 to 4 of the Bill, if necessary, 
under Section 5.3b, and I move Amendment 23. Okay. Members, have any comments on Amendment 23? Oh, anything else, Minister, to comment on? No, no convener, thank okay. you. Um, and then the question is that Amendment 23 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. That's agreed. The question is then that Section 7 be agreed to. Are we agreed? Yes. And the question that Section 8 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The question is that the long title be agreed to. Are we all agreed? And that ends uh, Stage 2 consideration of the Bill. Uh, before going into uh, private session, I just point out our next meeting will be on the 3rd of February where we will be having a discussion with David Vendell MP on the Smith Commission and Food Banks. I'd like to thank the Minister, our team and the Committee for taking us through uh, the Stage 2 amendments uh, so uh, swiftly. Uh, we finished ahead of schedule. Okay, thanks, everyone. I'll close the meeting at that point. I'll suspend the meeting at that point. <laughs>